What's up everybody, Rob here. So today we are going to be continuing our look at early modern warfare and how it changed during the course of history, basically from about 1500 to roughly 1800 thereabouts. And today we are going to be looking at cavalry. Now, I just want to say before I get started, uh, a couple things. First off, this is going to be focused mostly on how cavalry was utilized on the battlefield. Uh, not really going to go too much into the organization and the structure of, say, cavalry units or anything like that. And a little bit, maybe, but mostly it's how, you know, how their role on the battlefield evolves during this particular era. Um, also, I'm going to be not focusing too much on the technology, the weaponry and equipment, all that stuff. I mean, again, that will come up, but I'm not going to go into tremendous depth about that. Um, likewise, the other thing I want to say is that this is a general overview. This is not in any way extensive, uh, not something you can really base like a doctoral dissertation on. Just a general overview for people who say are familiar with medieval warfare, but want to figure out what happened slightly thereafter. So if you are already an expert on this subject or already well versed in this subject, this is probably not the video for you, though I suggest you watch it anyway because I care not from whence the views come, only that they do. And because this is a general overview, keep in mind that there are going to be exceptions to everything that I'm going to be saying. So uh, when I say, for example, cavalry did this, there's probably some country whose tactical doctrine said, okay, no, we're going to do this other thing. Or at this particular battle, this particular thing happened and that was more of an exception rather than the rule. Yes, I'm aware of all these things happening. Um, still, I want to keep it generally short and to the point rather than going on long, extensive, um, you know, details of everything that ever happened with a guy on a horse on a battlefield ever during this particular era. So, uh, without any further ado, here is a brief look at cavalry during the early modern era. So, for centuries during the Middle Ages, warfare was dominated by men on horseback in heavy armor charging out their enemy on very large, very powerful, specially bred war horses. By the late 15th century, and definitely by the time the 16th century rolled around, this was starting to change. The rediscovery of the pike, which is a spear that's about 15 to 20 feet long, in addition to the introduction of new technology, such as the musket, or initially it was the arquebus, would absolutely revolutionize warfare. So in order to still be useful on the battlefield, cavalry would have to adapt to these new changes. And one of the first things they did was adopt new weaponry. So, what you have here is you see a cavalryman wielding a wheel lock pistol. Now, a wheel lock pistol, and this is a closer look at wheel lock pistols, and if you'll notice the thing on the bottom there, that little wrench-like thing, that actually is a wrench, and it was used to wind up the wheel, which is that disc, which is actually a serrated metal gear. When, well, basically it works the same way as a flintlock in that there's a powder in a pan, and then you pour a maiden powder charge down the barrel, you put the, the ball, the, uh, the pistol ball down the barrel, and, um... When you squeeze the trigger, the gear would turn. It'd basically be just, you know, a spring-loaded... It would just revolve like a gear. And uh, that would rub against a piece of iron pyrite. The iron pyrite would create a shower of sparks. The, shark, the sparks would um, ignite the primer charge, which would ignite the main charge, sending the ball out the front of the barrel. Um, these things were able to be used on horseback because you didn't have to fumble around with a burning match cord, which on the back of a horse might be detrimental to the horse. I mean, horses generally don't like being burned. People don't either, but horses are much larger, so we care about them a little bit more. Firearms in general will be covered in a future video. So the introduction of the wheel lock pistol, as well as the introduction of another weapon known as the carbine. A carbine is, we still use them today, they're basically just short barreled rifles, or in this case, short barreled muskets. Oh, and just as a side note, um, oftentimes during this particular era, Cavalrymen who used wheel lock pistols, or especially the carbines, were oftentimes referred to as carbiners or writers. You see it there on the screen, so yeah, just so you know that that's what they would oftentimes be referred to as. In any case, they allowed the cavalrymen to actually shoot back at the enemy, um, rather than just stand there and, um, you know, get blown apart by the enemy's muskets, they could at least shoot back. And now, these weapons were very slow and very difficult to reload, especially on the back of a horse, therefore it was very difficult to maintain a sustained rate of fire. So clever military theorists came up with a new formation known as the Caracol. All right, so here's a real quick demonstration of the Caracol formation and how it would work. You got um, the enemy up here in a very small, tiny little uh, phalanx, but I don't feel like um, putting out any more at the moment. And you have musketeers, and in this case crossbowmen, because that's what I have on the flanks, pretty much a stand, pretty standard typical pike and shot formation of the era, and representing cavalry. In all my models, I do not have a single cavalryman. I have only entry, got a couple tanks too, but you know, that's another matter. Got a flyer, but uh, that's it. In any case, I'm going to be using the Armageddon Steel Legion because they're mechanized infantry and meh, why not? So 
If the cavalrymen here were to charge into the pikes, they would be skewered instantly. They would do probably no damage whatsoever to the enemy. They might break a few pike heads, which is, you know, kind of an inconvenience. But, you know, losing a, a well-trained rider and, more importantly, a very expensive, very carefully trained and bred warhorse, also not the best of ideas. So I would highly recommend you not do that, and they generally didn't. Now, they could go after the flanks and take on the, um, the very vulnerable musketeers on the side, but as soon as they do, these guys are just going to duck behind the pikes for protection, use the mobile fortress that is a pike block as a defense, and there's really not much cavalry can do at that point anyway. So they came up with the idea of the caracal formation, which takes advantage of cavalry's natural speed and mobility, and also uh, mitigated the... Uh, well, the fact that the wheel lock pistols that they were using are extremely difficult to reload and kind of finicky and you really couldn't get a sustained rate of fire. So this is how you can get, you know, masses, as much firepower you can downrange towards the enemy as possible while on horseback. It's actually incredibly simple. It's very similar to fire by rank. Um, only the guys in the front rank can fire, as I'm sure you can imagine. So they would move up to, you know, range with the enemy. Well, the Colk, uh, another thing too, I just want to point out. The Caracal will be much denser formation than this. This is a very shallow formation, only two ranks deep. Uh, it would actually be many, many ranks deep. Six, seven, eight, maybe even ten plus ranks deep. It would be much, much more extensive. I just don't... Ha well, I don't... I have the models. I just don't feel like maneuvering that many because I just... Well, I just don't feel like doing it. Let's just be honest with ourselves here. Any case, so what um, What would happen is the front rank would fire their, their uh, wheel locks into the enemy formation. Boom. Fire. And then they would just simply peel off and go to the back of the line. They'd peel off the side. These guys would then move up into range. They'd fire. Fire. And then they would then peel off and go to the back of the line. And then the third rank would do the same. And then the fourth rank and fifth rank and so on and so on. And I just want to point out throughout this entire process uh, nobody was stopping they did not stop to fire they would move up fire and then peel off all in one single motion so it, they were the horse was in constant motion the entire time the formation was in constant motion so the caracal was used by cavalry to utilize its strength which it was its mobility and also be able to get fire down range and, and be able to embrace this new technology um, also just want to point out too that uh, the cavalrymen oftentimes carried extra pistols on them they didn't have just one just in case they got to the front of the line uh, wheel locks are notoriously finicky and difficult to reload even compared to match locks and flint locks they're, uh, they're kind of a pain in the neck, and when you're on the back of a moving horse, it's kind of difficult to reload. So they would have two, three, sometimes even four or more pistols. Uh, also, keep, keep this as a reserve of firepower, since if as soon as the front line fires, um, if the enemy were close enough and they were to give you a very quick counter charge, you were vulnerable. So they would have um, the ability at that point to just drop the pistol they had, grab a new one, and have this reserve of firepower on hand. Okay, so the question is... Was the caracal an effective formation? Well, the answer is not particularly no. You see, the thing about cavalry is they have two main strengths. One of them is their speed and mobility. The other one is their raw power. The caracal utilizes neither. So as far as speed and mobility goes, yes, they are in constant motion. They are constantly, you know, moving and rotating and, you know, flowing around. Yes, that is true, but they're treading over the same ground. They're pretty much in the same area. And the muskets that are going to be shooting back at them um, they're not that accurate anyway. So, yeah, the, the, the muskets might, you know, might be firing at this guy. If you hit this guy here instead, or you hit this guy, or hit this guy, like, who cares? You know, like, as long as you hit something, you know, and when these guys are, like, they're doing um, volley fire. Uh, eventually, these guys were doing, uh, you know, like, um, volley fire by rank. Um, and there's this mass wall of lead. It really doesn't matter. Like, pinpoint accuracy really is not all that much of a difficulty. So, yeah, maybe it'd be difficult to target individual horsemen, but the mass block, you know, of of horsemen is going to be an easy target. I mean, horses are fairly large creatures, and you put a guy on it, you know, sitting on the back, that's a, another large target right there. So, these, this is pretty much just, like, incredibly vulnerable. This is an incredibly vulnerable situation for the horsemen. As far as the raw power was concerned, well... You know, they're not charging in, so they're not getting that, they're not even utilizing that particular aspect of cavalry at all. So that was blunted. And um, basically, what was happening here is that the cavalry was trying to become like infantry. They were acting in a, like, you know, it's similar to volley fire by rank. So they were basically trying to out infantry the infantry. And it just didn't work out all that well. 
And there's a couple limitations given the weaponry as well. Like Wheelock pistols, as we've already established, they are slow to reload. They are also not, well, firearms of this era are not particularly accurate anyway. Now you take the fact that you're on a constantly moving horse, and Wheelock pistols, you have to use one-handed. Uh, carbines, you can use two-handed, yes, but you still are on the back of a horse, using this thing fumbling around one-handed, maybe two-handed if you've got a carbine. And you're shooting now a small caliber, like these... The calibers on these things and their powder charge is not very large, especially compared to a matchlock musket. Uh, the muskets that the infantry use would be much larger. They'd be using a larger ball, larger um, larger powder charge, so they're just generally more powerful. And these guys are more steady. steady. So the firearm itself might not be um, as... Uh, may not be particularly accurate, no, but you are steady. You might have even you know a stand that you can support it on, uh, the muzzle of the the gun on and um and so you're more likely to get your your uh the musket ball in the general direction of the enemy as opposed to bouncing on the back of a horse firing a low caliber pistol ball which will bounce off of armor if these guys have any kind of significant metal armor on them which is not particularly uncommon um it's more than likely just going to bounce right off so and if these guys here, the cavalry do have armor on, fight the, the soldiers have armor uh, that is bulletproof, even against a heavier solid musket ball, which is much more powerful, the horses are not. And the horses are 100% a fair target as well. So these guys are just going to get blown off their horses, and provided they don't fall and get killed there, which is entirely possible, falling off the horses, you know, that sucks. But um, you now basically now have an enemy foot soldier who doesn't even have a real size musket. Uh, horsemen were generally blunted. I mean, they, they really played very limited, uh, had a very limited role, and weren't able to be utilized and really utilize their, um, their great strength to the maximum possible degree. Now, this is not to say that cavalry only shot at their opponents. There are different types of cavalry that did, in fact, charge in at the enemy, pretty much in the classical sense that they did during the Middle Ages. Mostly you have the gendarmes, I believe that's how you pronounce it. In any case, it's a French heavy cavalry unit that's more or less indistinguishable from uh, ca cavalry units from about a century or so earlier. I mean, yet the type of armor did change, but the basic principle, you got guys in full plate armor charging in with lances, and you have something that was very popular in England and other parts of Europe, but especially in England, known as the demi-lancer, which is what you see on the screen here. And they're called demi-lancers because uh, they use demi-plate or three-quarters plate, sometimes half plates, depending on where and when. But basically just means um, armor that does not cover their entire body, but only three-quarters of their armor, or sometimes roughly half or thereabouts. And um, I do, in fact, have a video about armor during this particular era. Maybe you should check that out, too. In any case, um, this would particularly common right, you know, in the earlier parts of the 16th century, um, the gendarmes and the demi-lancers and others of this particular type. But um, as the 16th century wore on and as we got into the 17th century, really carabiners and writers were more or less the way to go. And um, pretty much by the dawn of the 17th century, uh, these things, I mean, they were still around to an extent, but the demi-lancers and the gendarmes pretty much had fallen out of favor. So as the 17th century dawned, cavalry was reduced to a supporting role for the infantry, which basically was the dominant form of warfare on the battlefield, and also artillery, which, you know, field artillery was coming online at this point. So cavalry was, of course, used. They could shoot at the enemy from the caracal formation, but they were also used for their typical role of scouting and reconnaissance, and also running down fleeing enemies. You know, once the infantry and the artillery had broken their enemies, the cavalry would run down and pick apart the survivors. However, this was an era of near-constant innovation, and military technology and military tactics were no exception to this. So generals and military thinkers looked at the caracal formation, and they thought to themselves, you know, this is not the most efficient way to use cavalry. There's got to be a better way. And the answer came from a Swedish guy. This gentleman you see here, this is Gustavus Adolphus, the father of modern warfare, and it was his reforms that would absolutely revolutionize warfare. All right, so without going to, into too much detail over what he did, I'm trying to focus specifically on cavalry, but what he did was emphasize very strongly combined arms. The idea of combined arms, I'm sure most of you are familiar, but just to go over it real quickly, is utilizing different branches of service operating together in order to maximize their strengths and limit their weaknesses. Now, combined arms in and of itself is nothing new. This has been going on since, well, pretty much the dawn of warfare. But Gustavus Adolphus really formalized the practice to a degree that had not been seen before. Now, I don't want to go into too many details about what he did with his entire army. I just want to focus on the cavalry, but I do have to talk about his reforms with the infantry, specifically the musketeers. He increased the ratio of muskets to pikes to a much higher degree than had been there previously, so much more of his army would be equipped with muskets. Also, through a series of very strict discipline and 
pretty much endless drilling, he managed to reduce the number of ranks that were needed to fire uh, their muskets by rank from 10 ranks down to 6 and later on 3, which meant that uh, muskets could fire much more quickly and they can take up a wider frontage, which more or less means that um, the same number of men could cover a wider area than their opponents. So basically, the whole emphasis of Gustavus Adolphus was on firepower. Now, what does this have to do with cavalry? Well, what he did was, in the spirit of combined arms, mix his cavalry units with a detachment of musketeers. All right, so this is just a real quick look at the combined armed tactics of Gustavus Adolphus. Not anything extensive. Want to keep it relatively short. In case you have the cavalry in the center here, once again, the Armageddon Steel Legion, you got some musketeers on support on the side, and you can actually have this, they're... Um, They'd be intermixed. There'd be intervals in between. So you have cavalry, musketeers, and then cavalry, musketeers. Like they'd be integrated, mixed together, like this. It wouldn't just be one mass. It'd be multiple rows of it. But anyway, that's. I don't have that many models. I don't feel like moving all that much. In any case, the enemy would come up here mostly unsupported. This would be um, could be cavalry, could be an infantry unit, but you, more often than that would be cavalry. Uh, cavalry would oftentimes be put on the flanks of an army. Um, so cavalry would engage the cavalry and then roll up the enemy's flank once the cavalry was set into flight. But um, that's neither here nor there. In any case, what would happen is these guys here would move up and they would start doing the whole caracal thing. They would, you know, give their fire, then they'd go to the back of the line, reload, and all that stuff while the next line moves up. We just went over that. Now, um, what these guys did, because they had the extra firepower of these muskets... Um, they would simply overwhelm the enemy with massed firepower. Okay, so it's not you're not just getting shot back by other cavalrymen with their you know with their relatively smaller carbines and Willock pistols. No, you're getting full size muskets in addition to that as well. So these guys, you know, would be moving into range, and then they're getting pretty much like all these guys just going to be overwhelming them with firepower. And um, like I established earlier, the um, the musketeers, um, under Gustavus Adolphus's plan, instead of being 10 ranks deep, were 6 ranks deep. So they can cover a wider frontage, more lead can be sent down range at the same time. Alright, so once the enemy was thrown into confusion due to the just massive firepower that was just being leveled against them by these guys here, Gustavus Adolphus, and actually thinkers before him, uh, Henry of Navarre and uh, another gentleman by the name of Maurice of Nassau, um, they had this brilliant idea and they thought, you know, cavalry is really good at charging. They're, you know, horses are big, powerful animals. Let's just use that. that. That's what they do. That's what cavalry does best. So once these guys were thrown into confusion and chaos due to, you know, the massed firepower that was set against them, what would they do? They draw their swords and they charge in. Something that, you know, pretty much with the exception of like demi lancers and gendarmes, uh, more or less hadn't been done for the past couple of you know, decades up to this point, but almost a century at more or less, unless we're talking against an already broken opponent, but that's really neither here nor there. And that's pretty much exactly what happened at the Battle of Breitenfeld in 1631. Um, the Imperials launched a massive, actually seven, they attacked seven times against the Swedish um, right wing, where, right where Gustavus Adolphus was, and due to the firepower of the muskets and the cavalrymen themselves, they were driven back seven times, and by that point, the the imperial forces were in such disarray from being driven back so many times when Gustavus Adolphus finally launched his own attack the enemy was so badly depleted from just getting you know shredded by all these guns that they were just simply overrun and um, the entire imperial line just fell apart at that point so basically Gustavus Adolphus's great um, advancement was actually a step backwards he said okay cavalry charges we didn't. We stopped doing that because of technological changes. But now, by integrating muskets and instituting a policy of combined arms, he, he was able to overcome this and actually utilize cavalry in the old-fashioned way, but in a much more effective manner. The key to Gustavus Adolphus's tactics, which would later be adopted by pretty much all of Europe, was the use of combined arms, particularly supporting musketeers. A cavalry charge without infantry support would find itself stopped cold very quickly. So, the 17th century progressed with this as the main cavalry tactic, take up position along the wings of an army, take up positions along the wings of an army, move with infantry support, and then when the situation called for it, after artillery and muskets had done their work, ride forward, deliver a single massive volley with your pistols or carbines, along with the, that of supporting infantry, and then charge in with swords drawn. 
The combined arm tactics of Gustavus Adolphus freed cavalry from the shackles of the Caracal formation and allowed them to use their great strength, namely their speed and their raw power. Now, these and other tactics of Gustavus Adolphus became the standard of Europe throughout the 17th century. But as the 18th century dawned, military strategists were trying to come up with even more efficient ways to utilize cavalry's great strengths. And that's where we get this guy here. This is John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough. Like Gustavus Adolphus, Marlborough insisted that his cavalry charge in at the enemy rather than shoot at them, so much so that he actually banned his cavalrymen from even using any type of firearm at all. No pistols, no muskets, no carbines, none of the above. His innovations were only made possible, however, due to the introduction of a, of a new piece of military hardware, namely the flintlock musket and the bayonet. Up to this point, pike and shot formations relied on each other, the muskets relied on the pikes for protection, and the pikes relied on the muskets for their firepower. Now, with the musket and the bayonet combined together, every infantryman can basically be both. He can be both a pikeman and a musketeer at the same time. So, pretty much everybody, well, all the infantry at least, could shoot at their targets, which meant that um, there was more than enough firepower for Marlborough's tactics, which were actually incredibly simple. The cavalry would advance along with muskets, um, artillery and the infantry would soften up the enemy position, and when the time was right, um, the cavalry would simply charge home. This is taking combined arms to a whole new level. Cavalrymen did not have any ability to shoot back at the enemy. Instead, they relied completely on the infantry and the artillery to bring the firepower for them, and then once a favorable situation was created using the infantry and the artillery, the cavalry would charge in. Now, cavalry under Marlborough did not charge at full speed, it's important to note. What they would do instead is advance at a trot, which is you know, about roughly the same speed as a human jogging. This is for several reasons. The first reason was to maintain coordination amongst the cavalrymen themselves. Uh, they would ride knee to knee, literally knee to knee, and hit into the enemy formations at that particular formation. They were very closely packed. They were basically, there would be no gaps between horses at all whatsoever. The other reason is that infantry would be moving behind them in support. So with infantry um, close behind them, any breach that was made by the cavalrymen, basically they were just like a, a giant living battering ram, smashing through the enemy's line. Once they had been weakened by artillery and infantry, they would you know smash through and infantry would then be close at hand to exploit any breaches that were made in the enemy's lines. The key to Marlborough's tactic here was momentum. They did not stop to fire. Now, enemy cavalry units would still be using the older method. They would ride up, they would stop to fire, and then they would charge in. Um, Marlborough did not stop at all. So basically, once he started charging, they were just going to keep going. And um, when the enemy would stop to fire, yes, Marlborough and his men would take some casualties at that point. But at Basically, this was mitigated by the fact that before the enemy could really get started with their own charge, Marlborough and his men would already be upon them and engaging them in close quarter combat. Now, the idea of using cavalry's momentum as their greatest weapon was soon adopted by the rest of Europe. This again became pretty much the standard. Um, however, there were some changes to it, depending on when and where, specifically the Swedish, uh, namely Carolus Rex, who, you know, yes, he has an awesome Sabaton, al pretty much an album named after him, actually, a song and an album, which is pretty impressive. Um, he thought, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's use cavalry's momentum. We're not going to stop to shoot at all. We're going to, you know, they're not using firearms whatsoever. But we're going to go, we're going to do this at a full gallop because he's Carlos Rex and hey, it worked for him too. Well, until Poltova happened, but you know, we, we're not going to go down that road. So as the 18th century went on, standardization was the name of the game here. And military forces became more professional, more standardized, and ultimately more specialized. So the 18th century saw cavalry being divided into one of four major groups. And this is actually the crux of what I wanted to talk about. I actually wanted to make the entire video about these four groups and only these groups and keep the whole thing under 10 minutes long. Yeah, like that was going to happen anyway. Come on, it's me we're talking about here. Of course, it's going to be long and drawn out. There, now before I go into these four different groups, I just want to point out that they did not necessarily arise during the 18th century. They had, some of them have been around before that, some as far back as the late 15th century. Uh, just that they became formalized and standardized during this particular era, and they would continue to be so. Actually, some of them are actually still around today, though um, more or less cavalry units is either for ceremonial purposes, or they use other pieces of equipment like, um, you know, tanks and armored personnel carriers and that sort of thing. 
And I also just want to point out that each nation had their own particular take on each of these particular four divisions of cavalry and that they could either be slightly different or actually in some cases massively different depending on the nation in question and the circumstances at hand. And I also just want to point out that this is a general overview of those four units and um, I'm not going to be going into specific details about each nation like, you know, French units versus the Austrian version of the same thing. I'm not going to do that because I'm just not. Anyway, without further ado, we have the first one up. We have the Quirsairs. These are a heavy cavalry unit. They would be armored with steel breastplates and steel hamlets, something that was mostly an anachronism at this point. They were actually the only armored units at this particular point in history. Uh, infantry and other cavalry units, artillery, etc., would not be wearing any particular type of armor at this point, or if they did, maybe perhaps a general would have it more of a rank of office rather than um, actually being particularly effective on the battlefield. Um, the armor actually was pretty effective against long-range shots from flintlock muskets, you know, uh, one that's about to run out of energy anyway. It might deflect off of that. Um, also very effective against ricochets and smaller caliber, caliber pistol rounds. As well, again, um, it's actually pretty effective against bayonets and lances, too, um, and uh, enemy sabers as well. However, they were vulnerable to muskets and artillery. Because of the expense of the breastplates and the helmet, these soldiers were the elite of the elite. It meant that the state was willing to invest in them a very high amount of resources, and as such, these were probably the closest thing you're going to get to an aristocratic knight on a battlefield uh, that you saw during the Middle Ages. And like the knights during the Middle Ages, the Corsairs would be riding into battle on large, powerfully built, and very well-trained war horses. These were big men on big horses, and their job was to basically do exactly what knights did during the Middle Ages, and that would be charge home against the enemy. Now, their main weapon would be a sword of some kind, usually a saber, and they would basically just be a giant battering ram. They would use their, just the massive shock of these huge animals, and um, they would be very well, or at least reasonably protected, well, very well protected, actually, in a close quarter combat. And um, they would just smash into an enemy line, create a breach, which then other units could possibly exploit. All right, next up you have the Hussars, probably the most flamboyant of all the units we're going to be looking at here. These are a light cavalry unit. Now, the distinction between light cavalry and heavy cavalry, mostly at this particular era in history, comes down to the horses that are used. A heavy cavalryman uses larger, heavier, uh, more powerful beasts, whereas the light cavalrymen use smaller, lighter, faster, and more agile, agile horses. Uh, usually they have better endurance as well. Gazars would originate in Eastern Europe, specifically the Balkans. Uh, particularly, they would be Serbian and Croatian exiles fleeing from the Ottoman Empire after the Ottomans took their homeland. The name Hussar is probably derived from the word Hussar, meaning something along the lines of marauder or raider or bandit, something of that type. The main role of the Hussar was for scouting and reconnaissance, as probably the fastest and most mobile of all these different cavalry units, they were particularly suited for this type of role. It could also be used to strike at vulnerable enemy positions, for example, an exposed flank or um, an unguarded supply depot, possibly even an, art an artillery position that was left exposed and unsupported by infantry. Because of their speed and mobility, they were particularly suited for this role. They would be able to exploit any sort of mistake that the enemy would make. So, for example, say an artillery position was um, left without infantry support, and um, the enemy commander, before he can even realize it, you can quick send in a Hussar unit in there to overrun that position, and boom, now the enemy's guns are out of the fight. Like the Corsairs, the Hussars had very distinctive uniforms which set them apart from other cavalry units. The first and the most distinctive article of clothing that would be worn by the Hussars was known as a pelisse, which is a short jacket uh, that is oftentimes worn as a cape, usually over the left shoulder. It does have the, well, the stated aim was that it protects against slashes since they don't wear armor. Uh, protects against slashes from sabers and other um, swords that would be used against them. However, uh, more often than not, it's there just because it looks cool. And um, you see this guy here, he's got a yellow one hanging over his shoulder there. I just want to point out, though, that a pelisse is also a form of women's clothing. It was actually a women's coat that would be worn in the early 19th century. Um, I think there's pictures of Jane Austen wearing one. Um, in any case, don't tell them that. Uh, the other thing is the headgear that they have. It's that uh, round bearskin type um, hat that they're wearing. Uh, it's known as a busby. It is um, flat topped and overall rounded, though. I just want to say it does have... So 
So it does have some similarities to the bearskin um, hats that would be worn by grenadiers and other specialist infantry units, uh, but there are some differences there as well. It's not quite exactly the same thing. Also, I just want to add one more thing. The Hussars were also famous for their mustaches. This is an era where men were primarily clean-shaven and Hussars were not. They had mustaches because, again, it looked cool. And um, again, this was something that was pretty much universal regardless of the country. If you were Hussar, you wore the pelisse, you wore the busby hat, and you had a mustache. So if you see those a guy on a horse with those particular uh, pieces of articles of clothing or those particular fashion choices, Odds are this person is a Hussar, or at least he's trying to play a convincing one. Next up, we have Lancers. Lancers, as their name implies, are cavalrymen that use lances. Lances are, of course, spears that were to be used by horsemen. Like the Hussars, the Lancers are a light cavalry unit. They did not wear armor. However, unlike the Hussars, who were used for lightning fast strikes against vulnerable enemy targets, as well as scouting and reconnaissance, these guys were pretty much designed for attacking the enemy head on. Like the Corsairs, the Lancers were designed for shock and impact charges. However, because they did not wear armor, they were much faster and more mobile on the battlefield and could respond to changes much more rapidly and uh, more effectively. So because of the speed of their horses and the reach of their weapons, they were very powerful uh, with an initial shock charge. However, once the impact wore off, they were extremely vulnerable to close quarter fighting. The lance is a very unwieldy weapon to use uh, up close, especially against other cavalry units who would use things like sabers. So they were especially vulnerable. Like if that initial charge did not break the enemy, they had to either withdraw or pray that supporting infantry or another unit could come to help them out. In spite of their vulnerabilities, a charge of lancers could be absolutely devastating and decisive on a battlefield. At the Battle of Waterloo, a unit of French lancers was decisive in driving back the charge of the Scots Greys. So, to sum it up, lancers are light cavalry that use their speed and mobility to deliver devastating shock charges against the enemy. And last but certainly not least, we have dragoons. Now, dragoons are a bit of a unique case. Technically, they are cavalrymen. They do ride into battle on horses but they fought on foot, so they would use the speed and mobility of their horses to get where they need to go on a battlefield very quickly, but then once the fighting would start, they would dismount and fight on foot. Now, this meant that they had the strengths of both the cavalrymen and the infantry. As cavalrymen, they could get to strategic points on a battlefield quickly and effectively. However, cavalry in general, and this is true from cavalry throughout history, they are not very good at actually defending ground. They can take ground, yes, but they cannot actually defend all that well. The um, cavalrymen as a static target, they are highly vulnerable to an enemy's, enemy's counter charge. And um, dragoons mitigate this by simply dismounting, fighting on foot as infantrymen. So in this particular case, they get the stability of infantry with the speed and mobility of cavalry. So in a way, they're kind of like modern mechanized infantry who uh, ride into battle instead of on horses, they simply use APCs or something of that nature. Um, same idea. The name Dragoon comes from the particular type of firearm they used to carry, at least initially when they were first created, something known as a Dragoon pistol, which is kind of like a blunderbuss. A blunderbuss is really just a gigantic shotgun, and uh, they would carry these Dragoon pistols, and hence they became known as Dragoons. Now, it's important to note that there are exceptions to all of these rules. For example, in Great Britain, a dragoon was a pretty standard cavalryman. They did not stop to um, dismount, and um, they basically would charge in with sabers in hand. They're pretty much like a medium cavalry. They're not light cavalry, but they weren't medium cavalry. They basically acted like cuirassiers, uh, only they did not have the armor. Likewise, the Hussars of Poland were the famous winged Hussars, which were a heavily armed cavalry unit. They were not light infantry for scouting and reconnaissance, but rather a heavy shock cavalry. They were heavily armored, and they carried lances, so completely not like a Hussar at all. And there are some nations, like the United States, which never really made any particular distinction about their cavalry. All of the American cavalry units basically operated the same way. They could charge in with sabers, you know, sabers drawn, and they often did. Uh, they never really wore armor, and um, more often than not, though, they just fought as dragoons. However, they were never officially classified as such. Cavalry would continue to have a battlefield role throughout the 19th century, but by World War I, it was pretty obvious that the realities of modern warfare meant that men on horseback were no longer a viable option on the battlefield. Although horses no longer play a prominent role on the modern battlefield, cavalry still exists today in the form of mechanized infantry, air mobile infantry, and armored units.
So that is it for the video. I hope you found this interesting and entertaining. Uh, this was just a general overview. There is a lot of stuff I had to cut out. I want to keep this under a half hour long, and of course I failed at that. And um, I want to cover 300 years within that time period, so a lot of stuff had to be cut out, and there are some things I want to go into more detail about that I couldn't. I hope I gave some of you a springboard, you know, for those who are not familiar with the subject, something to, um, you know, use for your further research in this particular subject. Very fascinating topic. And um, I just hope I was able to be uh, at least some help with that. In any case, please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos coming out whenever I get around to it. And have a good day. Or don't have a good day. Your adults have any kind of day you want. See you later.